So hi everyone uh, and welcome to this video on uh, the consumption savings uh, model with a credit constraint. So uh, in this particular video, we sort of extend the normal uh, consumption two-period consumption savings model and uh, we introduce the presence of a credit constraint on some of the questions. So ideally we serve it, we solve the, mod, the problem first as usual and then uh, we'll get on to the credit constraint part of it so in this video we'll solve the problem like normal and maybe introduce the credit constraint by the end of the video and in the next uh, few videos we'll discuss the other sub questions okay so uh, we're given with this utility function uh, c1 course represents consumption in period one c2 is consumption in period two beta is a discount factor that discounts consumption in period two and uh, we have a weight of beta equal to one over 1.1 1 .1. and uh, we're also given with the fact that the consumer has no initial wealth so that means that a naught is zero right and uh, it earns income of y1 equal to six and the uh, y2 equal to 10 right so uh those are variables that we have and we also have a real in uh, a real in uh, a re an interest rate a real interest rate of 10 percent or 0.1 and uh, we have no taxes okay so uh for a okay so we want to calculate the equilibrium level so uh what we do is we form the lagrangian right we form the lagrangian and uh this is simply done as uh, L is equal to, okay, our utility function is um, square root of C1 plus beta square root of C2 plus lambda times uh, our constraint. Remember, our constraint, okay, will be um y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r equals C1 plus C2 over 1 plus r. That's our intertemporal budget constraint, assuming that the initial asset holding is zero. So we just translate that. So that's y1 y2 over 1 plus r minus c1 minus c2 over 1 plus r, right? Then uh, we take the first order necessary conditions, f o n c s and uh, we derive, okay, so we just derive with respect to c1. So uh, that will be um, a 1 over 2, c1 negative 1 over 2, plus lambda times negative 1 equal to 0. And that implies that um, 1 over 2 C1 1 half equals lambda. Okay. Then uh, our second FOC is with respect to C2. So we have there the beta. So it's going to be beta times 1 over 2 times C2 negative 1, 2. Okay. Plus lambda times negative 1 over 1 plus R equal to 0, which implies that... Um, beta over 2 c2 1 over 2 is equal to lambda over 1 plus r and it further implies that uh, beta times 1 plus r over 2 c2 1 half is equal to lambda okay and then our last foc is with respect to lambda and that will just give us the constraint right so that's partial l partial lambda and that's equal to y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r minus c1 minus c2 over 1 plus r equal to 0. Then let's label these. So we have 1, 2, 3. So um, uh, using, okay, using the first two, first two FONCs, right? What do we get? So we get 1 over 2 c1 1 half equal to beta times 1 plus r over 2 c2 1 half. I can rearrange and then make it 2 c2 1 half where 2 c1 1 half equals beta times 1 plus r. The twos cancel out and I can get uh, c2 1 half over c1 1 half goes beta times 1 plus r, right? So uh, if you think about it, that's like the MRS equal to that beta times one plus R term, right? And then uh, what else can we do? Okay, so we can have here, we can isolate with respect to isolate C2 one half uh, or C2 rather, C2. And uh, we get that C2 one half is equal to beta times one plus R 
see one one half and then uh, if we square both sides that takes out the one half okay what we're gonna get is c2 is equal to beta times one plus r okay squared c1 okay that's what we get and uh what we do is uh to find okay to find uh c1 star and c2 star we use the third foc we use three so we plug in this c2 into that third constraint so we get y1 plus y2 over one plus r equals c1 plus c2 so that's a uh, beta squared one plus r squared c1 over one plus r right that's the r constraint then course this cancels out so we get y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r equals c1 plus beta squared 1 plus r c1 okay and uh, we can factor out the c1 so we get 1 plus beta squared times 1 plus r right y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r therefore c1 star is going to be equal to um 1 over 1 plus beta squared 1 plus r times y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r. Then uh, if you think about it, we have values for all of these. We can get an actual numeric value for c1 star. So c1 star is equal to 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1.1 squared times 1.1, right? times y1, well, y1 is equal to 6 and y2 is equal to 10. So we get 6 plus 10 divided by 1.1 because our interest rate is 0.10, right? So it is 10% rather, right? So what we get here is um, 1 over 1 plus, okay? So you get uh, 1 divided by 1.1. That's the same as 1 squared divided by 1.1 squared times 1.1 and then this is uh 10 divided by 1.1 1 .1. uh and uh what you get with that is uh that plus 6 okay so we get um uh, 10 divided by 1 point whoops 10 divided by 1.1 1 .1, uh plus 6 that's going to be equal to 15.09090909 Right. And uh, this will cancel out. So we get um, 1 over 1 plus uh, 1 over 1.1 1 .1 times, uh, well, actually, to be fair, we can put everything divided by 1.1. 1 .1, so that's 10 plus. So we can do uh, 6 times 1.1 1 .1 here. This is 6.6. .6, so we have 16.6 .6 divided by 1.1. 1 .1. And then now uh, we can simplify the denominator. So you get uh, 1.1 plus 1, 1 1.1. That's 16.6 uh, divided by 1.1. And uh, that will be equal to 1.1 divided by 2.1 times 16.6 .6 divided by 1.1. And I will cancel out. And we're going to be left with okay, 16.6 .6 divided by 2.1. And uh, that's going to be this number. That's 7.90476195. And this is C1 star here. Right? So we have C1 star there. So how do you find out C2 star? Well, you can multiply. So you can plug it in here. So recall that C2 star is going to be equal to beta times 1 plus r squared okay, times C1 star. So beta is a 1 over 1.1 1 .1 times 1 plus r is 1.1 .1 squared. Well, this is just going to be equal to 1. So 1 squared C1 star. That would mean that okay, C2 star is just equal to C1 star, which is 7.90476195. And that's our C2 star. right? So our equilibrium allocation is C1 and C2 being equal to the same thing right? 7.9047. Okay. So that solves number uh, letter A. Okay. 
Then uh, for letter B, okay, suppose now that lenders to this uh, consumer uh, impose a credit constraint on her. So we're going to impose um, a strict credit constraint in this case, wherein the consumer is not allowed to be in debt at the end of period one. Now, notice, okay, okay, notice, okay, Y1 is equal to 6, okay? But C1 is equal to 7.9. So C1 star is 7.9. So at least by this logic, the consumer should be borrowing, right? Because the consumption, if I didn't have a credit constraint, the consumption is going to be higher than the initial income. So, um, but if I impose this credit constraint on the consumer, Okay, if I impose that very strict credit constraint on the consumer, the best that the consumer could do is just to consume Y1, which is equal to six, right? So um, so the answer to B is quite simple. Okay, since um since there is a credit constraint, a credit constraint, constraint. C1 star is going to be equal to 6, which is equal to Y1. And uh, because there's no storage, I can't carry over to the next period. Uh, C2 star will, subsequ will subsequently be equal to Y2. And Y2 in this case is equal to 10, right? So that will be the uh, end of uh, period consumption for period 2, okay? The reason why that, cannot, uh, that would be the case is... Um, Okay, consumer cannot borrow because they cannot have negative uh, savings in the first period, right? So this will be the case. And that's what we have there, right? So um, if you sort of look at this, uh, if we illustrate this in a, in a graph, okay, so C2 is here. Okay. And then say this is a C1, okay? And then say we have here, our line, and then say this is our endowment point, our initial endowment point. So this is y1, y2. Uh, so this is equal to 610. Okay. Okay. So for c1, this is 6. And then uh, for c2, this is going to be 10. Okay. Uh, this is going to be equal to the case with a credit constraint. So that's c1 star, c2 star with a credit constraint. So let's put a C there, C, C. But uh, in the normal case, okay, in the normal case, we have here C1 being equal to, in the unrestricted, no credit constraint case, we have here C1. So it, the endowment point must have lied here. So this is like 7.90476. And this is 7.90476. Okay, so uh, the pink is what we found in letter A, and the blue is what happens when there's a credit constraint because we cannot have negative savings in the first period. Okay, so that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll answer parts C, D, and uh, E. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.